joining us this week. Oh, thank you for that introduction. Um, yeah, I did talk about uh, St. Bueno in my talk, but that bit has been uh, cut to try and get it to time. So uh, yeah, that's really nice that you mentioned that lovely story and particularly the, the fact that he uh, said the curlew's nest would forever be hard to find because uh, that's both a blessing and a curse <laughs> in this project. Um, so yeah, I'm Lucy. Um, I work for the RSPB as a conservation officer. Um, most of my time is spent on the Kill You Life project, which is a, a four year project funded by the EU Life Commission. Um, we also have some funding from NRW um, and we're partnered with the National Trust and Snowdonia National Park. So lots of people invested in uh, Kill You in the area. Um, so my talk tonight is uh, an introduction to Curl U. I imagine a lot of you are already quite familiar with them, um, probably on the, the coast, but maybe not so much in their breeding ground in the uplands. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that, um, talk about the decline of Curl U in the UK and particularly in Wales, um, why we've had that decline and uh, um, what we're going to do about it. And then, yeah, talking through the project, what we're doing and uh, hopefully boosting the population of curl you during it. Um, right. Sorry, technical issues. <laughs> um, so you can't really talk about curl you without um, knowing about their call, which um, imagine a lot of you are already familiar with. Oh, it's not playing now. There we go. such a lovely call and uh yeah what the curl you are most famous for really um some people say it's haunting evocative melodic i think it's really cool and exciting it sounds like they're they're whooping and cheering when they come back um so so um yeah as i said a lot of you are going to be familiar with the curl you on the coast but i'm going to talk about them in their breeding habitat today so uh that sound to me is the the sound of the welsh uplands uh during the spring and summer and um talking to a lot of the farmers in the area the call was once very common and uh was the the start of the spring it uh for the farmers but they're now becoming quite silent unfortunately um, so I'll start off with a few facts about curl you. Um, so they're Britain's largest wading bird. Um, their bill is their sort of distinguishing feature, this lovely curve shaped bill, um, which they use to probe down into the soil to find uh, to find their invertebrate prey. The females have a, a larger bill than the males do, and that's one of the, the key differenti differentiations with the male and the female. They're quite hard to tell apart otherwise. Um, the bill sort of acts independently, like each side of it's like a pair of tweezers, and they have a, a short tongue, so you can quite often see them tossing food up in the air and catching it. Um, the diet very much varies depending on the time of the year. So when they're at the coast, they'll be feeding in the intertidal zones, um, 
feeding on uh, invertebrates there. And then whilst they're up in the uplands, they're feeding on all sorts of invertebrates. So earthworms, beetle larvae, tipulid larvae, spiders, anything that they can, can find, really. Um, the chicks obviously have quite a short bill, so their diet's quite different to the adults, which we'll, we'll talk about later. Um, they're a very long lived bird, so they can live up to 30 years. Um, that's been found from ringing studies. And it's actually a reason why we didn't notice the decline in curlew um, until it was quite late, really, because the main problem with them is uh, they're not producing chicks and getting chicks in the air. Um, so we've got a very aging population at the moment. We've got a lot of these older birds, um, but not many new birds being recruited into the population. So the, I'll briefly go through the curlews year. So uh, for me, that starts in March when they arrive back in their breeding grounds. Um, it's quite an exciting time of the year for us when we see the first curlew um, coming back to the uplands. Um, there'll, there'll be quite a lot of activity going on at that time of the year and it's a really great time to come and watch them really as they socialise and start to, to form pair bonds, displaying to each other and um, the display dance is really cool. They fly up in the air and bomb back down and call and whoop. Um, it's a really great time to see them. Um, by late March and April, they're starting to establish territories. So again, we'll be quite noisy setting up those territories and defending them. By April, they're starting to lay eggs. So World Curlew Day is on the 21st of April, um, a day I'm sure you've all got in your diaries. <laughs> and that's the, uh, the average date of first egg laying across the UK. Um, so they'll lay four eggs, well, usually lay four eggs, um, and they'll lay these on consecutive days. Um, I've got some photographs further on, but the, the nests are beautiful. They lay their eggs in this star shape um, and then they start incubating once all four eggs are laid. Um, both parents take charge of incubation, so they'll swap over. Um, shifts vary quite a lot, I think, depending on food avail availability and the number of predators around but the bird that's not incubating will stand on guard. So you'll quite often see a curlew that's um, stood on a mound or a wall or a fence post. And that's quite a good indication that there's a nest nearby. Um, the nests, as we've said already, are, are really hard to find, but um, that, that male or female standing at guard is a really good indication. They'll be incubating their eggs for 28 days. And uh, then they'll start to hatch, with, which is the exciting bit. Um, oops. Uh, so um, from as soon as they hatch, they are really mobile. Um, they can move up to 500 metres a day from being quite small chicks. Um, and they look after themselves. So they're very self-sufficient from the start. One of our challenges is keeping track of these chicks. Um, so we're regularly following broods and trying to work out where they're going and, and what they're doing. Um, so this show, shows really nicely the growth of the curlew chicks from one week old until they fledge at five weeks old. Um, and during this time, they're using lots of different habitats. So as you can see, in the first photograph, the bill is really short, so they're just picking things off the surface. Um, wet areas are really important to the chicks, so they'll often feed on aquatic invertebrate larvae and forage around the really damp margins of water bodies. Um, as they grow, their bill is growing too, so by, by five weeks when they fledge, their bill is very similar, not quite as long as an adult bill, but their diet will be much more similar to the adult diet. And we see quite a change in habitat during this five weeks, which reflects that change in diet. Um, so in the first week, they'll be trying to find wet areas to take the chicks. Um, and after three weeks or so, they'll move into more improved fields, which are more rich in things like worms. Um, and then 
by five weeks they're in in quite improved habitat feeding on on lots of worms as the adults do um so after the chicks have fledged um they pretty immediately start to return to the wintering grounds um so it'll gradually start to go quiet um from late july onwards and by mid-august all the birds have returned to the coast um, we're often asked, where do our kill you go? And um, we've not got a firm answer. It does vary quite a lot. But um, initially, most of ours will turn to the, return to the local coast. So you'll see them on the, um, on the coast of Anglesey and the Conway Estuary. Um, and then some of ours will go south and um, overwinter in Europe. And then a lot of the kill you that you'll see on the coast of Wales over the winter, a more northern population, so from Scandinavia. Um, this again gives a bit of a, a skewed representation of how curly populations are doing, because we get quite a big influx of, um, of curly over the winter. So I'll be uh, told by people, oh, I saw 300 <laughs> down at uh, Conway Reserve a few weeks ago. And I'm like, wow, <laughs> that's pretty much the whole of the Welsh breeding population if they were all Welsh birds. Um, so it does does give people a little bit of a misrepresentation of what the situation really is for curlew here in Wales. Um, so yeah, I'll talk a little bit about their breeding habitat. So uh, they are a farmland bird and they need a farmed landscape. So uh, we're talking about Welsh upland farms. Um, so where I work is um, around Ispiti Van and Hraithog, um, and onto the Midnight Moors. So it's, um, yeah, acidic grassland grazed mostly by sheep, um, and they need that, that improved grazed pasture for adult feeding. But they also need quite a mix of habitats, so it'll be those kind of marginal habitats between farmed land and upland. Um, they need a mosaic of, of habitats with different structural diversity and different diversity of vegetation type um, that will provide them everything they need with their, their diet at different stages and then provide them their nesting and their foraging grounds. Um, so sadly we are seeing a decline of breeding curlew in Wales. Um, the Welsh breeding population is estimated at 400 to 1,000 pairs. Um, that's come from, from surveys and then from modelling. And I would say that that's quite a good estimate. I would say they're more at the lower end of that scale at around 400 pairs. Um, where I work, um I'll, I'll show you on a map later but um it's supposed to be the the stronghold of curl you um in wales and we've got sort of 40 to 50 pairs um so yeah i'm not quite sure what we'd find a thousand pairs across wales unfortunately there's been a, a massive decline over the last 20 years um approximately 68 percent between 1995 and 2018 um so the curl you are now, um, the population is decreasing at such a rate by 2033, we won't have a viable pre breeding population of curl you anymore. So that's 10 years from now, um, which is really scary and makes this project just so important. Um, so we're hoping to halt that decline and hopefully start to reverse it during the project and then the legacy of the project, hopefully we'll be able to do that. Um, as I said, there's more birds over winter, but there's definitely a decline in the in the wintering population as well. Um, so approximately 42% decline over the last 20 years as well. Um, so yeah, a bit of a, a sad situation for Curl U. Um, this graphic here is, a little bit hard to to see but this is our project area and basically um it's looking for occupied and unoccupied territories um so the first picture is in 1994 
um, the blue territories, the, sorry, the blue squares show that they've got four territories. Turquoise are three, um, green are two, and yellow are one. And then the red squares are where there's no territories. And that's the, the one that we can really see an increase in number of red squares between 1994, increasing in 2008, increasing further in 2019. Um, we haven't done this type of uh, mapping during the project yet, but I'd probably say there's uh, even more red squares again, unfortunately. So that's uh, it's quite it's quite a good visual there that uh, the impact is so real. It's not just the the number of birds declining. Oops, my slides jumping. Um, it's their actual distribution and the amount of land that is suitable for them to use. Um, so why are they declining? There's quite a mixture of factors, really. Um, the main thing is, as I said, they just can't get chicks in the air. In order to sustain a population, they need to have 0 0.6 chicks per pair per year, which doesn't quite make sense. But um, basically, every two years, they need to have one chick. So it's not much, really. They're quite well adapted to having quite low rate of productivity. Um, but at the moment, they aren't even achieving this. Their uh, productivity is 0 0.1 at a push. Um, so they're ground nesting birds, curl you are, which makes them very vulnerable to predation. Um, there's been over the years an increase in generalist predators so we're talking about foxes crows buzzards red kites and the curlew have really suffered for this um the number of reasons for the increase in predators we've obviously got no oops my slides keep on jumping sorry um we've got no apex predators anymore We've kind of changed the landscape configuration quite a lot, which is better for these generalist predators. Um, so there's more sort of scattered blocks of woodland that crows, buzzards, kites can nest in and foxes can move in between. Um, Kill you will actually avoid breeding within 300 metres of woodland. Um, so even if there's no real risk there, they perceive that there's a risk there. So um Back, uh, I think after um, the Second World War, farmers were paid to plant blocks of plantation woodland and shelter belts to protect their livestock. Um, and this has meant there's quite a lot of scattered woodland in the uplands that wouldn't naturally be there. Um, and then, yeah, there's been uh, other changes in land use that have changed the suitability of it for curlew. Um, so things like changes in grazing, um, a lot of the time the uplands are now very undergrazed. Historically, they were very overgrazed. Both of these things are bad for curl you. Um, I'll just pop to the next slide. Um, so yeah, if there's not enough grazing, the vegetation becomes too high and the little chicks with their, their short legs can't move through that properly. So they need quite patchy vegetation. So there's rushes that they can hide in, but then they can move out into more open vegetation to, to move around and forage. So undergrazing is an issue, but overgrazing is also an issue. So if uh, there's too many stock on there, then it's gonna be really low to the ground vegetation. And that again, doesn't provide them anywhere to hide. There's also been a change in the type of grazing. So Welsh hill farms traditionally had more of a mixed stock. They'd have some cattle and then sheep. But a lot of the farms now are going out of cattle because you have to have um, a larger number of cattle to actually make it viable. Um, so farms that only have 10 or so cows are just getting rid of them now and just having sheep instead. Um, heavy grazers like cattle and ponies are really good um, for curlew and for other species. They, um, they, they're they heavy on the ground, so they make lots of uh, cleared spaces for other, other plants to come up through. 
um and they'll yeah they'll trample bits eat bits so you get nice structure of diversity of um of plants up there um while sheep are a little bit lighter on their feet a bit more selective on what they'll eat so some areas will get really dense whereas some areas will be um overgrazed so um yeah just that change in stock has had quite a big impact on them um the chicks as i said really like those wet areas to forage and um gosh 150 years ago um Herethog and the Mignite would have been uh, pristine well maybe not pristine but they would have been blanket bog in better condition than they are now um again after the the world wars um farmers were paid to drain their land um to make it more productive for grazing to help to make the UK more sufficient more self-sufficient in terms of food um so these drainage channels were dug into the peat and that's really dried it out and we're still seeing that drying effect and that's exasperated by climate change as well so we've really got quite degraded blanket bogs and all these pools that the curlew chicks would use to feed are drying out and they haven't got that habitat that they need we've also had a change from outdoor lambing to indoor lambing which means that farmers are not so interested in predator control it's not quite as important to them um, so that's kind of uh, changed the predator abundance again. So lots of things stacking up against them. Um, a final one that's less of an issue in upland Wales, where we work, but um, is a lowland issue, is the silage cutting. So uh, productive lowland farms will do their first silage cut in April, May sort of time when we've got nests and chicks on the ground. Um, they'll do another cut, maybe two, three through the summer, and um, chicks are just getting caught in the flail. Um, but this is less of a problem in the uplands where silage cutting is delayed until about July. Um, so the chicks have usually fledged by then. We don't have many dairy farms, fortunately. The dairy is a lot more intensive in their, their silage cuts. They try and get every blade of grass they can do out of their fields, whereas um, sheep farmers are a little more relaxed. Um, so due to these declines and the, the extinction threat of curlew, um, the RSPB developed a project to help halt that decline in curlew and try and try and help them out a bit. So. Um, We've got the Curl You Life project, which is a project in England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. So a key area was chosen in each of these countries um, and I'm running the one here in Wales. So the main aim is to halt the decline of breeding Curl You and we do all sorts of things um, to achieve that. So we're monitoring the population. Um, doing habitat management and restoration, predator control, engaging with farmers and local communities, influencing policy, and just generally trying to increase the awareness of the plight of the curlew. Um, I'll go through a few of these in a bit more, more detail. So there's been a group set up called Golvenir Gul Cymru, um, these are conservation bodies across of Wales, so RSPB, NLW, National Park, um, lots, lots of people involved in that. And um, we've split up Wales into 12 important curlew areas. So these are where we've still got strongholds of curlew and we actually think that something can be done about it. Um, so our project with the RSPB is, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but number two and three, which is Espiti Van and Hraithog. So uh, this is our site in a little bit more detail. Um, so Betsicoid is on uh, the west side here and the A5 runs kind of through the middle. 
and it's the upper Conway Valley. So the Conway is following through the middle of the site too. We've uh, split it up into five key areas, which are the places with the best habitat for curlew and the greatest density of curlew um, based on previous survey effort. Um, it's a beautiful part of Wales. We're lucky to be in the project in two triple SIs, an SAC and an SBA. Um, it's really beautiful blanket bog habitat and heath habitat. Um, the land is owned by a mixture of landowners. We work with the National Trust, with private estates, the Crown Estate and some independent farmers that still own their own farm. We work with 80 plus individual farmers at the moment. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, so we're working with loads of farmers and it's a real key thing that we're involving the farmers in everything we do because these birds are so closely linked to the farms and the practices that the farmers are undertaking. Generally, um, I think because the curlew are such a, a brilliant species, they're quite easy to get the farmers to engage with. Um, they already are very fond of them because they hear them and see them. They'll quite often find their nests themselves. Um, so there's quite good connection. And um, there's a lot of cultural connection with the curlew in Wales as well. Um, lots of poetry and literature written about the curlew. Um, so yeah, they're, they're quite easy to, to go to a farmer and uh, start talking about curlew, which is fortunate for me. Um, so the curlew surveys, we do these to try and look at the population size, where the curlew are breeding. Um, from that, we can look at what sort of habitats they're using, what habitats we need to protect and enhance. Um, we're looking for the productivity. So we want to increase that productivity from 0.1-ish that it is at the moment up to 0.6. Um, so we can only really see if the things we're doing to protect the curlew are increasing that productivity by doing the surveys. We can also, once we know where the nests are, put in direct measures to protect the nests and the chicks. And um, it really does um, help us to understand the requirements of the curlew and the main drivers of the decline. We've been using volunteers a lot this year, well, last year, and then we've had a, a massive recruitment drive for volunteers this year as well. So um, the volunteers are very key in doing these surveys, trying to cover as much area as we can and find as many curlew and uh, nests as possible. Um, we do brown and shepherd surveys initially. So we'll walk across the whole um, survey area, trying to record as many birds as we can do, recording their activity and where they are. Um, not just curlew, but other waders, raptors and corvids as well. And then we'll try and find little clusters of activity. And from there, that allows us to, to hone in and try and find those nests. Um, I don't know if anybody's tried to find a curlew nest before, but it's very difficult. So curlew are incredibly cryptic. So they'll almost try and lead you away from their nest. So they tend to... As you approach, they'll hunker down on the floor and um, walk beneath it and walk through all the vegetation and be like 100 metres or so from their nest before they fly into the ground. And then they'll do a bit of a display so that your attention goes towards where they're displaying. But actually, their nest is 100 odd metres away. Um, and then it's often very hidden in the vegetation. Um, I've got some nest pictures here and the nest isn't really made of anything. It's just a bit of a depression where they'll lay their eggs. Um, I love this collection of photos. It just shows the, the variation in the kill you eggs themselves and the habitat they're selecting. So we've got from like these lovely bluey ones here to golden eggs here. Um, 
so yeah each time you find a nest it's uh it's quite nice to to look at that variation and what they might look like you might not be able to see from the photograph but this one on the uh the far side here the eggshell is quite weird on it that it seems to not have the the shiny surface on the outside it's quite a rough rough surface to it which we think suggested maybe it was a second attempt nest and um, the female didn't have enough calcium resource to put into those eggs and I was not expecting that one to hatch but it actually did <laughs> so yeah we found uh, lots of nests this year um you can also see like the different habitats that they're selecting to nest in as well so we've got some that um are like grasslands um quite diverse acidic grassland as they said some are quite rushy and then we've got some in the heather our most unusual one was nesting within some gorse um so they really are a bit random in what they select and you read the the literature and it tells you exactly that they like a slope of a certain angle and the vegetation to be a certain height and what species but actually they're just quite random in how they'll select it really and uh, always surprise you so we found 17 nests this year um which was really exciting the year before in the first year of the project we only found two so uh, there's a mixture of the uh, well I, I can't say that's because of all the work we've done so far because we've only had one winter of habitat management between the first and second year so it was just really an improvement in our nest finding abilities and uh, the number of volunteers that we had out finding these nests something we did this year was um, installing temporary nest fences around the nests as we found them. Um, this proved to be really successful. We had no egg predation this year, which was absolutely amazing. Um, we had a few eggs which didn't hatch um, for other reasons, maybe egg chilling or infertile eggs, but generally at least three or four eggs hatched out of each nest, which was uh, amazing. So um, the photos kind of show what we were doing with the nest fencing. So we, um, the center of the nest, um, we paced out 10 meters in each direction. Um, so they're quite big nests. The idea is we don't disturb their natural behavior at all. So like I was saying, they'll land a distance away from the nest and then zigzag 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 through all the vegetation eventually getting to the nest um so we don't want to disturb that behavior at all um because that is their their predator protection really we've added this extra measure um but this doesn't protect them against avian pr predators at all so um yeah the nest the fences are quite big um powered by a solar energizer and they give out quite a punch one of our farmer's dogs found out um but yeah it's been a really successful way of protecting nests which uh we're going to try and do as much as this as we can next year as well um so this is a rough design of our our nest protection system and we've shared this with a couple of other organizations who are doing curl you work as well so um Hopefully these will start popping up all over the uplands of Wales and there'll be lots of curly nicely protected. Um, it's a really basic design, so we're hoping as well that we can roll it out to farmers who are interested in helping out as well. Um, thing we just have to emphasise is the importance of being really quick and efficient at doing it. We try and get these fences up within 25 to 30 minutes. Um, because obviously if you're taking the adult off the egg they're vulnerable to chilling um so again we'll only do it in good weather conditions we won't do if it's raining or too cold or windy um so we're quite careful not to cause any additional disturbance to the curl use and uh, definitely not cause abandonment of nests which would be um a bit of a disaster really as well as having our temporary fences, we've also got some permanent predator fences. 
Um, so these are massive fences. This is one we constructed last year. The fence is two and a half kilometers long and it protects probably the most important area for curlews in Wales, I'd like to say. Um, there's probably five pairs that nest in that area at the moment. Um, the RSPB have been surveying this area for 15 plus years and there has been over 10 pairs in here previously so hopefully we can boost the numbers back up to that as well it's also a really important area for lapwing um it's not confirmed but i would say we've got again the most important breeding lapwing population off a reserve um so lapwing do very well on reserves um but similar to curl, you they're just vulnerable to predation and the land uses have changed and very similar pressures. So um, we think there was 16 pairs of lapwing within this fenced area last year. So uh, that's really cool. So this fence is um, buried underneath the ground to stop the foxes from digging under it. And then it's um, 1.7 metres high in total. It's got electric wires on the top and one in the middle to stop the foxes from scrambling up. We've got another one that's going to be constructed starting next Tuesday, uh, which I'm quite excited about. We've got probably only two pairs in there at the moment, but we've done a lot of habitat works in there this winter and last winter to improve it for curlew. So hoping we get a positive response um, from the habitat stuff and then the fence will help protect them too. Um, so after the chicks have hatched, we try to monitor them, um, to try and look at what habitat they're using, um, try and count the number of chicks that we're seeing. Um, so if ones are getting predated, we're aware of when they got predated and at what stage. Um, so this is a, a nice graphic that we managed to capture last year of a curlew nest that's up on the midnight. It's an area where we've done a lot of peatland restoration over the past five years. Um, the nest was in quite a wet area. They, they're essentially where we've done this re-wetting work, selecting little islands in wet parts to put their nest. And we think that's a response to predation that the foxes don't like going through the water and also the curl, you can hear them moving through the water. So they had this quite, um, well, not a wet nest, but the, the nest was within a wet area. And then um, they moved the chicks. The, the star in the middle is within the first, uh, what was it, the first week there was three chicks, so one of them failed in the first week, but um, after the first week, we saw three that were foraging around a pool. Um, it's a pool that we created as part of the peatland restoration work. Um, and they were going in and out of rushy areas and uh, hiding in the gullies and stuff. So we saw them there for a couple of weeks. And then once the chicks got bigger, they moved them onto sheep graze pasture, which was more improved land um, with like clumps of rushes. So the chicks were sort of foraging in the open land and then they'd they'd run round into the rushes if there was any risk coming. Um, it's quite, quite cool, the chicks' response to predators, really, because um, they'll... They move around and are very independent, but they'll always be within about 100 metres of the parent. Um, and when the parent calls, the chicks just splat straight to the ground and uh, hides and just stay there until uh, it's safe to move again. Um, the Both the male and the female will look after the chicks. Um, it's common though for the female to leave and the male to do a lot of the chick rearing um this is because the females lost quite a lot of condition through um raising the chicks laying the eggs and then raising the chicks but we are finding where the nest protection is in place there's less disturbance to the curl you um from both predators and from livestock, because we've got an exclusion zone around that. 
Um, and this seems to mean that both parents are staying around for a lot longer because the female isn't getting as tired. Well, both of them aren't getting as tired out from chasing away predators, um, which is pretty cool because then both of them are a bit able to, to help raise the chicks. Um, so this story finished um, in mid-July when two chicks fledged and they moved up to the highest point around really and uh, we think that they go up and kind of practice their flight for a few days before actually actually going um the project that we've got in Ireland has seen this behavior quite a lot where they go up to a high point and then practice their flight so I think that's what they were doing um so this is a really nice story mostly um we lost track of chicks at quite a early stage really and this is partly because they're so hard to follow they'll move yeah a couple of hundred meters up to 500 meters between visits so we try and visit them at least twice a week to catch up on the behavior and we'll go to the the last spot they were seen and then listen for calls and look for activity but yeah they're often lost track of and it could just be that they're predated or it could be that we've lost them um but this year we are doing a radio tagging study um so hopefully about half of our chicks will have a radio tag on them this year and that'll allow us to track their movements um if they disappear we can find try and find those tags and that can give a good indication of what the predators are um they might be found in a buzzard's nest so that makes it quite obvious or taken down a fox earth um there's a few things where a few indicators of uh, different predation events and where and how the tag will be found um and it'll give us yeah just a really good indication of what they're doing um we do do uh, predator control as part of the project and it'll help the contractors to really target um their control around where the chicks are and properly protect them um so it's quite quite exciting development this year um so some boring stats bits but this is basically our results from this year so we had 51 pairs of curl you that we um recorded from our initial brown and shepherd surveys so these are maybe just birds that showed behavior suggesting that a pair but we didn't ever find their nest or their nest might have failed very early so we found in total 23 nests and of these 17 we put the temporary exclusion fences around and two of them were in our permanent predator ex predator exclusion area we had 77 eggs laid within uh, those nests and 56 of them hatched. So like I was saying earlier, the hatching rate was really high, um, which is a great achievement. Um, but from that 56 hatched, only 10 are known to survive through to fledging. So that is still too low for us. Um, the ones that we monitored, their productivity was 0 0.38. So it's still almost needs to double to be a sustainable population. So there's a lot of work still to do. Um, so as I said, predators are a massive problem for curl you, um, and we have got control in place for them. RSPB um, always want to do as much as they can with non-lethal predator control before we go to lethal control. So our non-lethal methods include fencing, um, felling, so and then removing habitat that's suitable for predators. So that is getting rid of the plantation woodland and removal of scrub and gorse. And we also do quite a lot of rush cutting. So that gets rid of really dense areas that foxes can move in between of. And then um, where we have to, we do do the, the lethal control as well, but it's all done to the highest standards. Um, RSPB have really strict standards and it's all evidence-based. 
Um, so outside of the breeding season, um, initially when I started this job, I thought I'd just be relaxing, but no. <laughs> um, so we're really busy during work with the farmers to restore these habitats. Um, so uh, we've been doing creating wet features. So that in some instances might just be a little scrape in the ground, but where we can do, um, as I say, we've got a lot of peats in the area. Um, so we're doing peatland restoration as much as we can. Um, I've got some more detailed pictures coming up and I'll talk about um, peatland restoration. We're doing rush and gorse cutting. So um, the curl, you like that diverse structure of the vegetation. So a lot of fields have become quite dominated by rush because of either undergrazing or grazing with the wrong stock. So we're cutting those areas. We try and like cut pattern, like wiggles into the rushes. So they still have um, little clumps and areas that they can hide in. So we're not cutting it bare. We're just creating that nice mosaic sort of habitat. Um, the important thing is once we've created that habitat is to maintain it. So um, we're enabling grazing where we can do. So this is um, either by putting in grazing agreements with the farmers, putting in fences if their fences aren't currently stock proof. And we're currently trialing um, no fence collars, which are cattle collars that you can use where you uh, put up um, a virtual fence almost, which allows um, targeted grazing of areas, which is really important in the uplands where there's the commons that are vast areas without fences and you can really target your grazing where you need it. Um, we're also doing the shelter belt and plantation woodland removal, um, which is really important for the curl you obviously, but also for the peat. Um, trees dry out the peatland because they're pulling the water out of it. Um, peatlands that are dry are emitting carbon. Peatlands that are in good condition are pulling carbon into it. So, um, yeah, getting the trees off the peat bogs is uh, really important. Um, <laughs> put in capital letters, working with farmers. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, working with farmers is really important for us because we can work on individual farms and make them as good as we can for Curl U. But there's so many farmers across Wales who are in potentially really good Curl U habitat and we can't do it all. So we're really working on our uh, relationships with the farmers, getting to be advocates of the project and curl you work. And something else we're working on is um, the new sustainable farming scheme. So there's a new agri-environment scheme um, coming in to replace the old one last year. And um, we're really, driving our policy team are to make sure that farmers are properly rewarded for doing this work for curl you and other species as well but uh, I'm more concerned about the curl you um that they're rewarded for doing the right things and uh, not just overgrazing it or whatever they have to do to make money um So these are a few pictures of things that we've been doing with the farmers. Um, we've got a scrape that we created there. So the chicks are going to be foraging around the edge there. And um, we put some fences in to allow these ponies to come and graze it over the winter. So when the curl you get back in the spring, the vegetation's in really good condition for them. Um, a couple more pictures of pools. Um, this is some peatland restoration work. So we're working blocking ditches, um, the ditches that were historically dug to drain the land. We're now blocking those, holding the water on the bog. These are quite new ones, but um, within a year, the sphagnum mosses start to grow. And within three, four years, these will be really well vegetated with mosses um, and they'll start to be building up that peat resource again. Um, so these are great for peatland restoration so for the carbon storage and the water quality they're also good for curl you because they use them for feeding 
and they're really good for invertebrates as well. The number of dragonflies and damselflies we've seen up in these peat pools um, is amazing. We've started doing some surveys of them, um, comparing unrestored sites and restored sites, and we're just getting a really great response. Um, the bottom two photos show some rush cutting that we've been doing. Um, one is a very fresh rush cut, and then the second one is rush cutting that's then been grazed by cattle the following year. Um, so you can see in that that really diverse structure, um, lots of places to feed and lots of places to hide, which is exactly what they need. Um, this is a bit more of a peatland restoration that we were doing. So um, the first picture shows peatland in bad condition. So this is um, they're called hags on the side here. It's like a cliff edge of peat. And um, when you can see peat, when you can see the soil, that means it's in bad condition and it's uh, emitting carbon into the atmosphere. And that will only get worse because um, it gets weathered. So it gets wind eroded. It'll uh, get washed further away um the stream well the ditch here will actually have quite a flow in it after storm events and that's just taking peat off the bog downstream so um the second photo shows it's restored so we've broken down these peat cliffs and revegetated them and then we put dams across and that's slowing the water flow off the peat body and um keeping it up there where it should be and um, farmers have noted there's um, been an impact on the peak flow on the rivers. So they're not flooding as quickly as they were doing uh, before the peatland restoration. Um, so the final thing is engagement. We've got a community engagement officer and she works really hard working with the, the local community. Um, basically we can't save curl you by ourselves um we've got a team of of three people working on site doing everything we can but we need to be working with the farmers we need to increase the awareness get policies changed um to try and get farmers to do the right things for curl you um we're currently working forming farmer clusters so these are like groups of farmers who will work together because Curl, you don't just use one farm in isolation. They'll be using uh, several farms together because they roam over such a large landscape. So there's no point in one farmer doing good stuff and his neighbour crashing his land. So, uh, yeah, we're trying to get farmers to work together as much as possible and then getting them rewarded for that through uh, agricultural environmental policies. Um Sean's done a lot of group of work with uh, local school groups and agricultural colleges. So trying to get the, the next generation of farmers to uh, think more about the environment and biodiversity and the way that they farm. We're also engaging with volunteers. Um, we've got about 35 volunteers now recruited for surveys this year, um, but we are always keen for more. <laughs> so if uh, anybody's interested, in becoming a volunteer please do get in touch so yeah that is me thank you for listening and i'm open to any questions well thank you very much indeed lucy that was really comprehensive uh, lots of new information there which will i'm sure be of interest to everybody that listened listened to your talk this evening thank you very much indeed um and yes, can I invite anybody to ask Lucy more about what uh, we've just heard? Uh, can I say something, Nigel? Yeah, please. Go uh, on. Well, firstly, thank you very much, Lucy, for a great talk um, and sort of telling us all about your research into curlews. Um, I did like your, your, with the way you started off with the, uh, the call of the curlew. And I, it'd be great if we could have that as an alarm to wake me up in the morning because it's <laughs> such, such a beautiful, yeah. beautiful call. And I, I remember about 20 years ago, uh, I lived near Pili Palace near Menai Bridge, um, and we did have curlews nesting nearby. I remember 
in the field opposite the house, uh, an adult landed with a few chicks and they were calling and it was fantastic. And and I, I think they've they've gone from that site now and anyway, which was quite sad. Um, I was just a few years back, um, we had Tony White had a bird at Kemlin and it had some green rings or flags on its leg. And it turned out it was actually from, I think it was from a head starting um, sort of plan um project that was going on in germany which was something that we oh, right. not, not heard of so that that was like really interesting because I, I know they've been doing it a lot with waders like things like spoonbill sandpiper in russia and i think they're even doing it with like blacktail godwits and stuff but yeah. i didn't realize they were actually doing that with with curlew in in western europe so uh, uh, there is a welsh project for head starting as well the curlew country project which is on the shropshire um borders They've mm -hmm. got a head starting project um, yeah. that is currently using chick, well, eggs that have been rescued from an airfield um, mm -hmm. where they'd have uh, broken the eggs anyway. They take those in, incubate them, and then releasing them into the wild. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, head starting is definitely something that we have been thinking about. It's a very last resort thing um in my opinion it's it's very expensive and it's not something that we can roll out across wales but as an emergency response it might be something that we have to consider that we've got a head starting project really boost the numbers of curl you and then they can start spreading out from there it is the is one of the main products i know all the species of curl on the planet seem to be declining is it major is it mainly due to the fact that a lot of their natural habitat has been churned up and turned into agricultural land yeah mostly um yeah i think habitat degradation is the main thing worldwide um in the uk predators are a big issue i'm not so sure, so sure worldwide if predators are the same issue if there's been that kind of switch in predator abundance that we've seen in the uk um but yeah land use change is definitely driving the decline yeah yeah mm. okay. yeah well thank you thanks steve for your question thanks lucy for a comprehensive answer uh whilst you were giving that sue carter's asking have any of the farmers changed their grassland management uh um schemes since you uh, were involved yeah, yeah. So we've definitely um, we've got some grazing agreements with a few of our farmers. So they're um, grazing it with different stock at different times of the year. Um, there's some areas that have been previously abandoned. Quite often happens on triple SI. So a lot of our project is on triple SI mm -hmm. and the farmers think that they're not allowed to do certain things on the triple SI. Um, which means they'll often be abandoned. So mm. we'll often go to a few farmers and be like, why, why don't you graze that bit? It'd be really good too. And they don't think that they can put a certain type of stock on there or they don't think they can do any cutting and management on it. Um, so we work alongside the farmers and NLW to make sure that the agreements are in place that they can graze it in a way that's better. Thank you. Any other questions? There's a couple of others in the in the oh there's a few in the chat so um i've lost it now there we go so apart from destruction of chicks and nests are there problems with the feeding of adults and chicks um it's something that we've started to study alongside bangi university so we had a couple of master's students last year um looking at invertebrate diversity and abundance in different plots generally for adults there is enough food available because um a lot of the fields around the farms where the sheep are grazed are quite heavily improved for agriculture which means quite a lot of fertilizer goes on them and the number of worms in there is quite a lot um but for chicks there's definitely food shortages in some areas they need to have these wetter areas to feed in and these have been lost from a lot of uh, a lot of places and also they used to feed more 
in hay meadows um in those really diverse grasslands and there's fewer of those around now so uh yeah food availability for chicks is definitely an issue okay and barbara asks are they site faithful from year to year generally yes um so we had between year one and two there was a couple of nests that were in the same field but maybe in like a different corner of it so within sort of 50 100 meters but generally they are going back to the same places um you won't see immediately a response to habitat restoration because of that um because it'll take a few years for maybe a new pair to find oh this is a nice bit of habitat the old pair will keep going back to the same old habitat but we have found um a couple of birds have responded to our peatland restoration and we think those were broods that failed with their first nest and then they've been flying over maybe um we also had golden plover on the site so they perhaps heard the golden plover and then gone to explore and uh, gone for a second brood there and then they've come back the following year so we have seen some positive returns from our habitat restoration already the, the last comment in the chat from Jean is that um, curlews fly into the mud around the small islands below Menai Bridge towards Beaumaris, and she was there at Dr. Raj Jones, and below her house there were at least 150. So. Wow. <laughs> Lucky you. So they'll all start to leave soon, I guess, mm. um, return to their, their breeding upland areas. Um, but yeah, I think around the Straits, there are still a few scattered pairs that use those fields. So mm. you know, somebody's not shaking their head. <laughs> Nigel, can I ask? I mean, it's a great presentation, Lucy. I'm sure you give it to lots of groups and you've got colleagues that are engaged in the schools. But I wonder about reaching out to wider communities because, you know, the, when the RSPB have done things, or well, when various nature groups have done things, I mean, things like the Ospreys, and last year with bee eaters breeding in um, in Norfolk, it engaged the community that wouldn't necessarily be drawn to it. So you know, the, there's a, a wider audience, and I just wonder about you know, do you in, is there any way of encouraging around I don't know World Curlew Day or whatever people to go up to the moorlands to actually hear the birds? Because you talk about the evocative call, which we'd all agree about. <clears throat> but you're almost it's almost preaching to the converted and I suppose the question is how 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 a new community of people might be engaged in the way that's been achieved with other sort of symbolic birds and I just wondered if there's anything you th can think of actually engaging that type of grouping yeah that's a really good point because yeah we often just tell people in RSPB magazines and stuff how wonderful <laughs> the things are we're doing and uh, they all agree which is great but um we're really concentrating on engaging with the farming community because that's obviously where they're breeding and the people who can actually have a impact so we spent a lot of time at agricultural shows and um talking to the farmers directly and then to the policy makers something else we're doing this year is we've got a live streaming camera um, which we're going to set up on one of the nests so we'll have live curl you cam so people can watch what they're up to and um, hopefully that'll start to appeal to a wider audience if uh, people engage with that but um, yeah you are right to to actually target the people who like I still when people ask me what my job is and have to say oh, do you know what a curl you is and quite a lot of people don't surprisingly so um yeah, it's just trying to get that out there as much as possible. Um, Can I ask if you could actually, when you, if, if the Curlew Cam does go live, mm -hmm. could you send it through to the groups so that we can actually try and use any social media channels we've got to try to promote it? Because I think it'd be. Yeah, yeah, that would be great. <laughs> that's be just, just one little um, bit of information. I mean, the, um, there's probably about, 350 birds come into roost at uh, twice the less at Anglesey uh, each evening. But yeah. the last July, on the 7th, 5th July, I just looked at the records, and the 6th of August, um, I had a colouring bird that apparently was satellite tagged as well as part of a, a piece of work that's been done by the Game and Wildlife Conservation uh, Trust. 
they made actually tagged, they, they tagged 14 birds between um, the forests of Boland and Northumbria, Northumberland and Northumberland. And uh, the bird I'd seen had actually flown uh, from the in, left uh, the forest of Boland in the morning and flew straight to Tritholas, where it's, it, uh, where two birds, two, two satellite tagged birds, have been wintering. So it just showed you your comment about birds moving in from other parts, more northern parts. And I guess related to that, I mean, there was obviously a lot of controversy about the French uh, giving licenses for shooting curlews at one point. I yeah. suppose if the Welsh birds are moving south um, without satellite tagging information, it'd be difficult to know where they go. But if they do go to the continent, I suppose there's always that difficulty they might um, um, come unstuck with uh, shooting practices across Europe. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it's something we can't influence too much, but something we're definitely concerned about. Um, but yeah, they're just traveling vast distances and we can do all we can in their breeding area but the wintering area we don't have too much control over thanks thank you, Martin. Thank you. and thanks lucy uh, i see that um, th there's a question in the box about using uh, trail cam for looking at pred predation or of nests do you yes. do that lucy yeah sorry i didn't mm -hmm. mention that but yeah in all of the um the areas that we fenced off um, we put a trail cam up as well so we could see any potential predation events there. So we did see a couple um, of attempted predation events by um, crows, mm -hmm. but they weren't successful. And the cameras will just about pick up stuff going around the outside of the fences as well. So we saw a few fox activities around as well. Mm -hmm. right. There's you. also a question then um, of the chicks that didn't fledge, any idea of the age at which they died um not exactly no i think a lot of them after the first week we were losing track of um so yeah it's it's hard without the tagging study to actually tell if they've been predated or if they've just moved quite far away and we haven't managed to find them but i'd say a lot of them don't survive past that first week really that's when they're they're really small really vulnerable um they're prey size to all sorts of uh, of things all the crows buzzards kites whereas when they get a little bit bigger they're a little bit less vulnerable well thank you again Lucy. yeah steve yeah, oh, yeah. just what just one more question if that's okay slightly yeah. flying off at a tangent uh, i know it's one of your study areas was on the moors above pentravoilus mm -hmm. uh, that used to be a site for large heath butterfly are they still up there as far as you're aware or have you heard anything? I'm not sure on the particular site you're referring to, but we've got them up on the midnight on one of our peatland restoration sites. We had a few up there, I mm. think, two years ago. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I think there, there's still some in the area. OK, that's, that's good, good to know. Thank you. That's good news, too. <laughs> Thank you. Well, it's nearly nine o'clock, and, and I know that Lucy hadn't long been in from work when she... Uh, started her talk so I think we should call it a day for your sake Lucy uh, <laughs> but to thank you really sincerely for a super talk really brought it up to date as Martin said this is such a, an evocative and symbolic bird and it's very appropriate that you've given us this talk the the day before World Wetlands Day mm -hmm. um, it seems so appropriate this is one of the birds that everybody associates with wetlands and yet it's in serious trouble. And it would be a terrible indictment of Wales today if we lost it within 10 years. I'm hoping that your innovative project um, has come just in time to save that awful tragedy, because it really would be to lose this bird. Um, getting your message out as widely as possible seems the best thing to do if, and you, we can see how much effort you're putting into that plus all the, the de detailed uh, site specific efforts you're making with fencing etc mm -hmm. just shows you that the level <clears throat> of expertise and physical effort that needs to go in when the situation gets this serious mm -hmm. but I think other birds have shown in Britain that if the re if targeted science-based efforts is put in it can be very successful birds can rebound and I sincerely hope that's the case with Curlew and Wales and indeed throughout Britain 
I hope your project is seen as a start of a resurgence and all good luck to you, uh, with, to you and your team and the volunteers that help you. I hope you'll be able to come back in a few years time and report how successful it's been. Meanwhile, as Martin said, if there's anything we can do as a group to spread the word, or indeed if there's any of you out there that want to act as volunteers, then please get in touch uh, with Lucy's project and, and offer your help. So thank you again, Lucy. Uh, yeah. All best for this coming breeding season. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>